W B N E. Dear listener, today's going to be a good day, and here's why. Because today, I mean, I know I said last week was the best day ever, but this week truly is the best day ever. I'm Becca. And I'm Eni, and this is Sincerely Us, a podcast for the casual musical theater fan. Hi, Becca. <laughs> Hi, Eni. Um, listeners, this episode's going to be a little different. Uh, we're trying something new where we want to interview people that are in the... I'm talking really fast because we just finished what you're about to listen to, and Becca I just... has a lot of emotions right now. I, I mean, to be fair, I do too, and I don't speak, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, we got to interview someone who I really look up to, I guess. She's really positive social media presence and is a really cool person that we got to talk to today. We got to talk to uh, Amanda Flynn, who you'll hear all about her in a second when I intro her during the interview. Um, she's done shows like The Lightning Thief and Be More Chill, and she was the vocal coach on those. I'm probably rambling at this point. <laughs> I mean, but what else is new? It's fine. It's true. It is true. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, we, we um, I don't know how many of these interviews we're going to get to have. Right. But um, this is kind of definitely a more interviewee question answer than our normal conversation. Mm-hmm. But I... I'm very excited for you guys to hear this because I, although I didn't speak a lot, I am currently obsessed with what just transpired. Yeah, it was, um, it was a really, both of us were pretty nervous of when we talked about privately together, um, about if we wanted to do something like this. And so, um, I reached out to Amanda Flynn and asked her if she wanted to be on the show, not expecting anything. Yeah, and she was the first person that got back to us and the first person we reached out to, so that was awesome. And we just were curious about, like, how vocal health, what you could do for your vocal health and what her job is as a vocal technician. And she talks a lot about that. But we also talked a lot about just, like, musical theater in general. (laughs) Um, As we do on this show. Right. Um, But like Eni said, this wasn't really her guesting on on our podcast. It was definitely much more us interviewing her and getting her opinions. Okay, well, that's enough of us talking. Let's hear what she has to say. Amanda Flynn is the owner of Amanda Flynn Voice Studio in New York City, where she coaches performers on how to maintain their vocal health day to day. Just this year, she has worked with two Broadway shows, The Lightning Thief and Be More Chill, and helps those performers with the strain that comes from doing a Broadway show eight times a week. She's an incredibly positive and lovely presence on social media and someone we are very excited to talk about. Welcome, Amanda. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for saying that I was positive and happy. (laughs) That makes me happy. That's a big thing we try to push on our show. So it's cool that you're one of the first people that we're interviewing. (laughs) I'm so glad. Thank you for having me. I feel so honored to be here. Now, before we get too far into the interview, what are your preferred pronouns? My pronouns are she, her, her. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So just to like begin, where did your love of theater and performing come from? Um, You know, that's a great question. I um, uh, grew up, my my parents were divorced right after I was born. So I sort of had my house with my mom and my stepdad and then my house with my dad and my stepmom. And my stepmom was a dance teacher. She um, like was in charge of like a dance, um, like a, like a dance team, like a college dance team. Mm -hmm. And um, so she put me in dance class like immediately as soon as I could like walk. Um, and then my mom, um, was really musical, just grew up in a really musical family. Mm -hmm. So we always sang in church choir and, uh, in choir in school. She played the guitar growing up. And, um, and so, you know, we just were always singing and lots of music. So I sort of grew up with like music and dance being really important in my life. I, my, stepmom got a piano when I was in about third grade. Mm -hmm. My dad bought her this like beautiful baby grand piano and I begged for piano lessons. (laughs) I just, that's all I wanted was piano lessons. And so I got piano lessons. And so, you know, I sort of always grew up with that. And then when I was probably... I guess in like late elementary school, middle school, my sister was about five years older than me. And so she really got into theater and really got into community theater. 
Um, and high school theater when she got into high school. So I did a little bit of community theater um, growing up, which I loved and did like, you know, um, different sort of like performing opportunities with the community theater and like, you know, my piano studio. I was in like a little singing group. We were called <laughs> Sugar and Spice. <laughs> we so were cute. in like third or fourth grade and we would like sing at like, you know, nursing homes and stuff. It was great. That's um, so and when cute. I got in, yeah. When I got into high school is when I really started doing theater. Um, that was when I, I, we had a really great theater program in my high school. I just went to a regular public school and, um, we had just an amazing theater teacher and did amazing shows. We did three shows a year. And so it just was really, really awesome and truly life-changing for me. And that was when I really fell in love with it to the point where I knew I wanted to do it for the rest of my life. I sort of had moments when I was in middle school where I was like, I think I want to, I want to do this. I want to dance forever. And then in high school really it was you know I really wanted to do it but my senior year I have this very like clear moment where we were doing Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoats <laughs> and I was playing the narrator <laughs> yeah <Yes. and laughs> I was double cast with my best friend Abby <laughs> um, anyway we um, who just came to see the lightning thief last month still very that's so awesome so, um, yes yeah, so we um, I remember literally just leaving the theater walking to my car to get in my car and I I just had it was like clear as day I have I, this is what I'm gonna do every day forever that's amazing and it was just like such a clear moment I kind of always you know wanted to do it but that was the moment I was like oh no this is crystal clear yeah this, this is my trajectory that's amazing so, so <laughs> you mentioned Joseph Technicolor Dreamcoat but was there a show that like really impacted your life um growing up I, I mean you know that was the moment for me when I was like this is the thing I want to do forever I want to sing and be on stage and perform and this is it but you know for me growing up I mean I'm I'm a kid of the 90s so mm -hmm. like my gateway drugs <laughs> were <laughs> Les Mis and Miss Saigon yeah. and Phantom awesome. and Cats you know that was the stuff that I fell in love with musical theater I mean my sister and I and my younger brother we used to um we used to make home movies and we absolutely made a home movie of Phantom <laughs> absolutely made a home movie of Les Mis with a barricade behind <laughs> us amazing. we got all the furniture we could downstairs made a barricade my brother was like eight so he had to be Gavroche I mean obviously <laughs> it was amazing we made our own Beauty and the Beast the musical I mean we did everything Thing. And so we just would make these home movies of all of these musicals that we loved. Um, but yeah, I mean, truly, as a kid of the 90s, those were those were my gateway shows. And so, you know, there's still gateway shows for a lot of people, yeah. too, which is really oh, for cool. Sure. You know, it's like you hear Les Mis and you're like, what is this? <laughs> what is this crazy thing happening? You know, um, and so, yeah, those are the those are the shows that just got me hooked, really. Yeah, I think everyone has a Les Mis phase where, like, it's the only thing they listen to for like a year. <laughs> I remember oh, being sure. a freshman in college and my roommate was just like a random, like, you know, like assigned roommate, uh, which is this really, really sweet girl named uh, Kelly. And she, um, she, I was like, you have to listen to Miss Saigon. <laughs> have you never heard it? And I sat her down and I pulled out a CD and I put it into my little, you know, CD player that I had and just sat there and made her listen to the entirety of Miss Saigon as I explained things. <laughs> and explain what was going on. It's like, you don't understand. You have to listen to this musical motif. It's going to come back later. <laughs> that's that's definitely me with my best friend yeah, that yeah. On here. <laughs> truly so when people are like i made my best friend listen to be more chill i sat them down and made the list i'm like i get it i mean i did it about miss saigon my freshman year of college this poor roommate was like okay uh -huh. oh no i did that to eni last month i was like you need to listen to the lightning thief right now it's changed my life um so you just yeah. need to you need to sit down and you just need to appreciate it <laughs> I mean, she did the same thing with Be More Chill. It's true. Because I had no idea. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I love that, like, those are people's gateway musicals now. You know, that makes me feel, it makes it feel very full circle for me. Yeah, so. definitely. And um, they also are big shows for teenagers to get into uh, musical theater, which I think is so cool. I'm a dance teacher, and a lot of my kids, when we do, like, drills around the room and stuff, they're always like, can you play that song about the guy that's a goat? And I'm like, yes, the one from The Lightning Thief. Of course I can. <laughs> um, so we listen to that and then sometimes I'll play them like Hades Town and stuff. And it's cool to see like the interest 
like musical theater is cool now. Like it wasn't cool when I was a yeah. teenager, and that was only last decade. Like it truly. Yeah. I mean, we have things like Glee and mm-hmm. Smash, and we have things like that, you know, you know, uh, love them, hate them. But we have the, them to thank for Absolutely. bringing musical theater into the mainstream. I mean, truly, you know, it's like, you, know, you don't have to love the show, but people started, uh, people started loving musical theater. And then we started seeing so many more movie musicals being mm-hmm. made, the, the musicals and li- live, you know, ABC and Fox yeah. and everyone. And so it's, or NBC, <laughs> I think it is. Anyway, um, but, you know, we started seeing that start to happen, you know, and and I think, you know, I think it was like the, the kismet of having, you know, Glee and Smash and these things start to happen at the same time that we had the pop culture yes. phenomenon of Hamilton. And so you Absolutely. have this like perfect storm of people turning on their television and seeing musical theater where they want to or not. And then you have this cultural phenomenon of this show that sort of defied the theatrical boundaries. Um, and then it was like perf- a perfect storm of like musical theater becoming mainstream again which is really exciting because people are exposed to it and people you know want to do it now more than they did 15 20 years we ago. we actually so, discussed absolutely. that on, on an episode recently where we talked about how um shows like the lightning thief would not have been on broadway had hamilton like not come in and have been like we don't have to sing about we don't have to be you know the show to me piano all of that we can be fun stories with like kids with disabilities or you know a half goat man um and hamilton really was like the thing that busted the door Mm -hmm. open for that and it's amazing yeah yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the things, you know, I think that, I think that if you, when you look at musical mm. theater history, you see a lot of different moments mm. that really, you know, you know, kind of chip away at that door. I mean, yeah. you know, even going back like to hair being like the first yeah. rock musical. Absolutely. I mean, like people did not know what to make of that. They were like, what is happening? Right. But it changed musical theater and people mm-hmm. went, Oh, we can put this type of music on Broadway and get away with it. Well then. Yeah, because okay. w- without hair, you don't. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. You You don't get Hamilton. Exactly. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, it's like all of these things chip away, right? And then if you don't get Hamilton, you you probably don't get Be More Chill. You don't get The Lightning Thief. And then you don't get whatever's coming in another couple of Um, years, you know? So let's go to like your job as a vocal coach, which is something that is so fascinating to me because I didn't know that a vocal coach existed (laughs) until I started um, following you uh, because of The Lightning (laughs) Thief. So, um... You mentioned on your website that you were an Uh actress and you had a hard time keeping up vocally um, with like performing. Uh, Can you elaborate on that? Like what what does that mean? Sure. Um, So um, I moved to New York to perform. Right. And so I I came to New York, never had any intentions of being a voice teacher or, you know, a a singing voice specialist or any of those things. And, um, you know, I came here just to perform. And so I did for a while and, you know, did um, was lucky to do uh, Mamma Mia. I did the Las Vegas production of that. I was in the original L.A. company of Wicked um, and, you know, did a lot of regional theater and tours Mm -hmm. and different things. And so, I you know, I I did a lot of stuff. Um, And when I was... um, out on the West Coast doing one of those shows, I really um, I started running into some problems with my voice. It was really kind of random and felt weird and um, was just having trouble. You know, I just, I couldn't really, um, I couldn't really maintain my voice. I was yeah. having trouble singing stuff and I just knew mm-hmm. something was wrong because I'd never had these issues before and I was a, you know, a really trained singer and I kept up with voice lessons even after school, like when I was in New York and, you know, I mean, I wasn't perfect, at all. No one is, but I, I knew that something was up and it was actually a really stressful experience. First of all, because it's really stressful when you feel like you can't do your job. Um, and it's really stressful when it's your voice in particular, because our voice is so tied into who we are as Mm -hmm. people. It's sort of the thing that defines us as humans and how we communicate and, and it feels so personal, right? It feels more personal than like spraining an ankle. (laughs) You know, it feels very, yeah, it feels like who we are as people. It's what identity, what I, identifies me as a person, right? So I was having these issues with my voice and, and I was just met with being told that I didn't have any good, didn't have good technique, that I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to take care Mm. of myself. All the blame Mm. was being put on me by people around me. And it was really terrible. (laughs) (laughs) terrible. Yeah, it was horrible. It was, it was really stressful because I, I didn't know what I was doing and I was just trying to fix it and get better so I could do my job better and feel better about the work I 
was doing. But, um, you know, I was just kept being told, you don't, you're not sure what you're doing. Your technique is bad. You don't really know how to sing well. What you're doing is wrong. And, and that was coming from the production. That was coming from the doctors I was seeing, mm-hmm. the voice therapy. And no one really knew what was going on. Um, yeah. and so was, was really stressful. And so when I left the show and came back to New York, um, I got in with a voice team here in the city and they immediately fixed the problem. Um, and I immediately got connected with people that, um, were able to get my voice back on track and, um, everything was back and operating and great. And it was really eye opening for me about a lot of things. One being that, um, we don't really offer any resources mm. in our industry for singers. You know, when you do a long running show, when you do a Broadway show, mm-hmm. you're going to be given physical therapy or some sort of body work um, that's going to be provided by the company so that weekly you're able to, you know, have some sort of massage or, or physical therapy or something so that your body stays healthy, right? So that you're able to keep your body up and running because we know that that prevents injuries, mm. but you're giving zero resources for your voice. Um, and and it was sort of expected to do these crazy things with our voice and, and given nothing. And I thought this was so stressful, right? Like I, I, like this was such an easy fix. Once I came back to New York, I was given a proper diagnosis. I was put on the right medication, mm-hmm. my inhalers that I was on, cause I had asthma. Those were the things that were causing the problem. So those got changed. The problems went mm-hmm. away. It was like, this was not complicated, right? This is an easy fix. Yes, right. Yeah. Like, and now, and then I just had to do a little bit of like singing work to sort of fix the habits that had come in through the time that I been there trying to figure stuff out. And so, you know, I thought, wow, this is crazy that this was such an easy fix. And and it was the most stressful six months of my life. Right. Um, and then on top of that, I thought, wow, the voice is crazy. Wow. We really don't know a lot. And, and how easy was it for people to tell me that things that they didn't know what was wrong with me mm. or that it was, it was all my fault and not that there was any solutions. None of these people could provide me with solutions. And so I started to get really interested. I kept performing um, and did some, some different, some different things over the next couple of years, but started, continued to have the wheels turning about, um, about, uh, the voice and, um, started teaching a little bit and kind of, you know, playing with people's voices and really liked it. I kind of hit a point in my career where I thought, you know, I really, when I'm not performing, I, for me, I really need to have sort of a second career that I love because yeah. I can't sustain myself on, on, on doing the other, the side jobs that I've been doing for so long that are wonderful and great and have, you know, brought me wonderful people in my life, but I I need something else. And so I decided to go to graduate school at the time. So I sort of took a little pause from performing, went to grad school, um, and studied performing and teaching and pedagogy in grad school. Um, and then when I graduated, I started teaching a lot. Well, I taught a lot all through grad school, but post grad school, I started teaching a lot and auditioned some, and then my teaching just sort of took off Yeah, and I sort of call myself accidentally retired. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm I love acci- that though. accidentally retired <laughs> because I just, I just started teaching and, and that just kind of took off for me. And I started to go, Oh, this is the thing I'm really good at. Yeah. You know, this is, this is the thing that, that like I, that really like gives me the most purpose in mm. my day. And this is the thing that makes me feel um, the most sort of complete as a person. And um, so yeah, I haven't really looked back. Yeah. That sounds awesome. perfect. I hope that answered your question. As I was just finishing, I was like, I don't remember what the question was. I'm a terrible interviewee. That's okay. No, it's okay. You are, you're doing great. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's perfect. Um, you have very similar energy to us, so this works out perfect. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so what exactly do you do day to day? Like when you were, I know Lightning Thief just closed, but when like week to week, what were you doing with um, the professional actors that you work with? Great. So I, I do a couple of different things. So I have a private studio, right? So in my private studio, I work with professional performers, mostly musical theater performers, um, mm-hmm. handful of, uh, you know, people that write their own music, singer songwriters, but most people are, are musical theater performers. So that is sort of my, my main business. But then I also work at Pace University in the musical theater mm-hmm. program. So during, during the academic year, I also, um, have a full load of teaching voice lessons there in our musical theater program there, which I love. Um, and so I love having these like different worlds and then sort of the third world is working on shows and sort of the being production focal coach. So I love all these different 
little pockets mm-hmm. of the voice world because they all sort of influence each other in kind of interesting yeah. ways. You know, it's like I learn something when I'm working with, you know, a college sophomore that I can then apply to someone in a show, yeah. right? Um, so as far as the shows go, though, um, you know, it, since I had, you know, sort of my moment with my voice, it has been really one of my goals to try to change the culture on Broadway with um, the voice. Mm. Well, first of all, with sort of destigmatizing uh, vocal injuries, right? So that we start to understand that singers get injured just in the yeah. same way that, that actors and dancers have physical injuries. Dancers sprain their ankles, singers hemorrhage their vocal folds. It just happens, mm-hmm. right? And so that's kind of been the first thing. And I'm, you know, that is the plight of many of my colleagues as well to really work towards changing the stigma, both in the Broadway community and beyond. Right. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, um, trying to change the culture as far as understanding that when we provide voice resources in a show, we can help prevent some of those injuries and we can help keep our actors in the show um, when they might be out otherwise. Just in right. the same way that physical therapy or massage or the different body work offered by by companies can help keep people in shows, right? When they can have yeah. physical, when they can have PT once a week during the show, like in between shows one day. It helps their body stay up and running. So why would we not offer resources for the voice that could do the same thing, that could help the actors, you know, do a lot of different things, right? So a lot of the different things that I did were um, in the beginning, you know, making sure that actors felt like they had a good warm up. Making them, you know, meeting with them, yeah. working with them on their voice, getting a sense, you know, working through bits in the show, a sense of the stuff that like they felt was hard or complicated or the easy and, and really tailoring a warm up to them so that they all felt like they had a warm up. They really was never, never at a loss for what to do in a warm up. They had a good warm up tailored to them. Um, working through the show, um, with Lightning Thief in particular, you know, they'd already been on the road <clears throat> for, seven months at, at that time, which was great because they all came in and said, these are my hard spots in the show. They all knew exactly what they struggled with and what was easy. So that was great because there, we didn't have sort of the learning curve, you know, be more chill yeah. had happened off Broadway as well. So there was a little bit of that, but there'd been a little bit of a, a hiatus between yeah. off Broadway and Broadway. So they were kind of coming in fresh. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, George knew exactly what parts of Michael in the bathroom were hard. He was like, yeah. these are the hardest parts for me. I mean, because he sung that song of 16 million trillion bajillion <laughs> still million times still singing it in his sleep I'm sure <laughs> he will till the day he dies but you know so there, there were you know luckily I guess with both shows really people came in and they had a sense of what was easy and what wasn't mm. um, you know Be More Chill stuff was still changing in the preview process right. but you know Lightning Thief they came in they knew exactly what was nothing changed yeah. <laughs> they knew exactly what was hard they knew exactly what was easy so it was really easy to go in and like work through the stuff that was hard come up with solutions that made it feel easier get them a warm up tailored um, and then a lot of the other stuff that I did was um, just sort of be a little bit of a vocal health resource for the actors okay. um, as they tried to navigate through things. Um, you know, we didn't really have any vocal injuries during the run, which was great. But we had That's illness. Awesome. I mean, everyone gets sick. Yeah. It happens, you know. Um, particularly right after opening, there was like just this like just this barrage of illness that went through everybody. It started with Chris and then they just went down. We actually had all three of the, the um, standbys on in one show. Oh and, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Because it was like, we were down and I was like, we can't lose anybody else. We've got nobody else. <laughs> Our backups are on stage. <laughs> They're all on stage. I was like, stage managers are going to have to go on, and, you know, play Clarice. Who knows? So, um, so, you know, helping them deal with illness, illness and figure out, you know, when, when they had a situation that was like a, a cold, you know, shoving medicine down their throat, telling them what to do. (laughs) Um, and then kind of helping them make the decision of like, no, this is worse than that. We need to get you into a doctor, helping facilitating, getting them into, um, a laryngologist if they need a laryngologist Mm -hmm. is a voice specialist. So, you know, you may have heard of an ENT was the ear, nose, throat, but Mm -hmm. a laryngologist is, is someone who's even more specialized than that in just the voice. Um, and Mm -hmm. so I have relationships with many many of the top laryngologists in the city. And so I'm able to get people in pretty quickly when needed. And so kind of helping facilitate that, um, helping warm people up before shows, right? The first time Sam went on in previews, Chris, Chris pulled something in his back and Sam went on in previews and he was like, will you please warm me up before the show? Cause he was nervous. Yeah. Cause he was going on for the first time. And so I warmed him up. You know, I warmed George up 
twice a week during the entire run of Be More Chill. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with, you know, with Be More Chill, sometimes I would, I would warm George up, uh, like before the Drama Desk Awards because he sang at the Drama Desk Awards Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, went with him to Kelly and Ryan, you know, just there's like a, as like a resource to just make sure that everyone's feeling good, um, feeling good about their voice when hiccups come along the road, illness, fatigue, et cetera. And there's a sounding board to kind of help them, um, you know, help them figure out what the best course of action is, um, and to make sure they get in the right hand should they, you know, <laughs> need to get in someone else's hands. Yeah. And then one of the other things I do is I do a little bit of hands-on work. So I've, I've studied a couple of different, um, hands-on, um, modalities like myofascial release and some different stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, and so doing like some different stuff in the neck and the tongue and jaw and different things like that, that, um, tend to be really great for fatigue. Mm-hmm. So, um, I found them to be really helpful. Um, when, uh, you know, when actors are feeling tired, um, and they've, it's been really helpful. So that's kind of, you know, a smattering of the things I do, um, you know, as far as, you know, the, the schedule is all over the place with the shows, (laughs) you know, it's like, there's like, you know, you'll have like a few things that are sort of set every week. You know, some people like that regularity, Mm -hmm. you know, of like every Thursday at three, I'm going to come see you. Right. Um, and then, you know, then there'll be like something crazy that'll happen (laughs) and it's like all hands on deck for three days and madness and, you know, we just, we deal with it and we, we move on. <laughs> so, um, kind of, kind of related to what we're talking about. I know that all of the people who have played Evan Hansen in the past talk about like how crazy it is that they have to like be on strict diets and stuff like that. Um, do you, do you facilitate anything like that? Or there's specific dietitians? Um, you know, I think that, um, that diet, dietary stuff is so personal mm. That, you know, there's no one diet that's better for the voice, generally speaking. So it's not like, a, well, if you want to be on Broadway, you can't eat Dairy. green foods. You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, it's like, well, you know, no, I mean, it, the reality is that some foods really impact some humans. Mm. Some foods have literally zero impact on some humans. Mm. So, you know, a lot of people um, like to eat as clean as they can mm-hmm. because they feel better, mm. right? Um, they feel better when they don't have dairy or maybe don't have gluten or don't have added sugars or are just vegan or paleo. I mean, there's truly, I mean, a million different ways to eat Mm. (laughs) that can make you feel really good, right? So I think anytime you're performing at a high level with your body, Mm. um, what you eat is important. And the reality is that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, my my brother played in the NFL for about eight or nine seasons. And so he was always doing crazy strict diets, Mm. right? But, you know, it it, it was about finding the thing that worked for him Mm -hmm. and the amount of protein he needed to have to feel successful and feel healthy, um, you know, what he needed to eat. He wouldn't, you know, he would stay off of gluten for, you know, during the football season and different things because that made him feel better. Okay. The reality is that for some people, gluten does nothing. (laughs) When the reality is for some people, gluten makes them feel sluggish. So if you're having to do something like Evan Hansen or frankly, like Percy Jackson, right? Yeah. You know, and you're having to do something crazy like that, you know, you might need to eat a certain way to make you feel good. What mm. that certain way is, is really going to be individual. You know, if somebody were to feel like their, their diet was really getting in the way, you know, the first things most people would do would be to take away things like dairy and gluten mm. and gluten, sugars yeah. and stuff. And that's usually what it would be. But if someone were, to, someone were to really be focused on diet, I would definitely get them in the hands of a good nutritionist because that's not really my field. Mm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell people sometimes that they can try cutting something out and see if they feel better. I mean, mm-hmm. That's usually what happens <laughs> when you, you know, see somebody, they're like, you know, cut things out, bring them back in, see how you feel. But, but I'm not a, a believer that one size fits all, mm. you know, yeah. what I need to eat might be different than what you need to eat. Yeah, and that's absolutely. Okay. okay, cool. Um, so I stalked your website and on your website, it says that your next, we both <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, your next project is, is in Atlanta at the junior theater festival. Um, what are some things that you tell younger performers to help with their vocal health, like as they're changing or as they're maturing? Yeah. You know, um, you know, I love the junior theater festival. Mm. I go every year. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'm it not. is. Okay, so it is this amazing festival sponsored by MTI and Disney um, that happens in in Atlanta, <laughs> and it is um, uh, it is like about eight thousand middle schoolers who love musical theater. So that's it amazing. Is the thing you wish you had <laughs> when you were in sixth grade. 
for real truly and you just walk around and it is literally just these like groups of middle schoolers in this like giant hotel all just screaming show that sounds amazing that's (laughs) i know you want to go now (laughs) yes (laughs) Uh, but the junior theater festival is amazing it's 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 created and run by this company called Mm iTheatrics um which is actually a, a company that's like very very near and dear to my heart they make all of the like educational versions of broadway shows oh cool so okay. broadway junior collection broadway kids they make all the for all the pub, big publishing houses they make all the educational versions but that's actually where my husband rob works that's oh. been his day job forever working as a um as a, a music editor there wow. so um yeah, so they're very much like family, the, the, the people there. Anyway, that's the Junior Theater Festival. Um, so what are things that I tell, that I tell young singers? You know, honestly, you know, things that I would, uh, considerations, um, that I would make for, um, a young voice to stay healthy are really similar to really kind of any voice. I mean, some of the most important, you know, things, um, when it comes to your your voice are staying hydrated, obviously, drinking a lot of water. I, it sounds so basic, but you'd be so shocked that most people don't drink enough water. <laughs> um, and it's just so important for vocal fold for hydration, as well as just general health, mm-hmm. right? Drink a lot of water, drink a lot of water. <laughs> um, you know, I encourage um, people when they are singing a lot um, or if they're sick to steam, getting okay. a steamer. If you've seen mm, those before, yeah. you'll, see them on my, you'll see them on my website. There's a lot of different kinds. Um, but that basically you're inhaling steam or mist and, um, that's my cat knocking something over. Sorry if you heard that loud crash. We love cats here. Completely fine. Um, so, um, steaming is really great for the vocal holds because it allows you to inhale the mist of the steam, um, and, and feel nice and hydrated Mm. internally. Um, you know, I think that, you know, some really important things are that when you are a young performer and you really, um, want to sing, um, even if you don't know if you want to do it professional or not, professionally or not, I think training is really important. Um, I think finding a good voice teacher, um, somebody who teaches you the type of singing you want to do. And that's really important because a lot of times, um, you might find a teacher, uh, in your community who maybe only teaches classical singing Mm. and you really want to sing musical theater. There's nothing wrong with classical training. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of crossovers between different genres and types, Mm -hmm. types of training, but very often people will go to a teacher because maybe it's the only teacher in town and it's all classical training and all they really want to do is sing show tunes and then they're going and they're trying to sing material that they're not being trained in and so they're not getting guidance on how to make the sounds that they're trying to make when they're listening to those cast recordings does that make sense yeah it does make sense so uh, that sometimes is is hard because that's they're not getting guidance on the stuff the sounds that they're actually going and jumping on their bed and doing (laughs) you know behind closed doors right right? Uh, you know they're getting guidance and making different types of sounds that are maybe not in line with what they want to be doing really. So I think that's really important. You know, with the beauty of the internet these days, you can get lessons online. Yeah. So if you're like in a community where you really don't have any options, you know, you can meet with someone online. You know, I think when you're young and growing, I think in-person lessons are really helpful because I think there's a musical element that sometimes can't be completely mastered over the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being in the same room with a pianist, you know, feeling, you know, that sort of relationship. However, if you are really wanting to learn how to belt and no one in your town will teach you how to belt find someone who will teach you how to belt on the internet <laughs> meaning, not meaning go to youtube but meaning hire yeah. a teacher who can listen to your voice and you know give you you know teach you um you know uh, give you lessons on on the internet um, because you'd be surprised how with technology these days how good they can be i mean i do tons of online lessons i mean when i have people on tour or you know away on gigs i'm meeting with them all the time right so i think training is really important i think just general vocal health you know hydrating steaming, making sure you don't overuse your voice. Mm. If you, if your voice, if you're using your voice a lot and it starts to get raspy or hoarse, you've gone way too far. So learning moderation with your voice is really important. Mm. And I think really important when you're young, particularly when you're in environments where you're talking all day, you're yeah. listening to cast recordings at lunch and, you know, screaming <laughs> at the top of your lungs. And then you go to rehearsal at the end of the day. You know, we, we sometimes lose track of our vocal mm. load when you're young. I mean, we lose track as an adult. <laughs> 
but I think it's easy when you're younger, you know, to all of a sudden get to nine o'clock, the last hour of play rehearsal, and you're like, I can't talk. <laughs> and so learning how to moderate yourself, mm. I think is really, really valuable. And that is one of the most valuable things you can learn as is when you're younger, truly, is how to moderate, moderate your voice so that you don't overdo it. That's really interesting. It's something I've just never thought about. So it's so cool hearing like your yeah. professional opinion on it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My professional opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just going into like general musical theater questions now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, obviously, Lightning Thief closed, so you, you can't be biased anymore. But what's your favorite show on <laughs> Broadway right now? My favorite show on Broadway right yeah. now? Oh, my God. <laughs> I know that wasn't in the list. I'm throwing you a curveball. It wasn't on the list. You did not <laughs> prepare me. Um, honestly, I have to even think about what's running. Then just what first one you think of? I mean, I loved Oklahoma, but it just closed. Yeah. But I really loved that Oklahoma revival. You did? For sure. I did. I loved it. But I also love Oklahoma. <laughs> like, you can kind of just, like, gather people and sit there and read the script. And I'm like, I love this show. It's so good. <laughs> it's just, like, my favorite Golden Age musical. So, like, it doesn't take much. Uh, in a production for me to love Oklahoma. I'm like, this is so good. So, but I, but uh, I thought that was really good, but that's closed. So that probably doesn't count. Does it? I'm literally about to get out my phone to see what's still playing. That's fine. Take your time. Isn't that terrible? Oh my God. Take my time. <laughs> what kind of podcast is this? There's editing software, Amanda. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my What's God. Up? I'm no. literally looking up shows that are running on Broadway. Well, I'll give you mine. Mine's Beetlejuice. But yeah. Okay. I actually haven't seen it. I mean, Hamilton's great. What you else know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, okay. okay. I have an answer. Slave play. Oh, but that doesn't count. You said musical, right? Or did you say show? It's okay. We could just say theater. That's fine. Yeah, I'm supposed to pick a musical, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's okay. You favorite. can say slave, slave play. Slave play is my favorite thing on Broadway right now. It's probably my favorite thing on Broadway ever. See, I know nothing about it. All I've heard is like really good things. So I definitely yeah, should check it out. Yeah, you should go see it. Come to New York and go see it. I think it closes next week, though. So that probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> um, but if it were to happen, I would say... Come and see it. Um, you know, it's so hard. You know, it's it's funny because I, I – people often will be like, what's your favorite show? But I truly – I really – I don't know that I ever have had mm. favorites and I've always kind of been that way. That's kind of always, you know, I remember when I first started dating my husband, he's like, what are your top five favorite musicals? I'll tell you mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, but you know, for me, I was like, well, I really like this, you know, and I like that. And I like, that. you know, it's like, I don't know. I just tend to appreciate mm. them so much that it's really hard for me to rank them. I'm the exact same way. Are you? Every time, every time we have like a list or some sort of like, which one do you want to talk about? I'm like, I, I can't decide. Like, yeah. I, I love them all. <laughs> I just, I just, I guess, mm. you know, I appreciate them so much that I just, I can appreciate mm. them for different values. And it's hard for me to rank those yeah, values. That makes sense. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 yeah. And so I know some people are so not that way. They're like, no, this is the best. And I'm like, but I just, I just, ne- I've also just never been that way, like about shows. Like, you know, I loved musicals. I mean, I would drive around and listen to musicals in my car and I would get obsessed mm. with one for a moment and then would have be- become obsessed with another one, you know, but I, I just, I truly have never been like, this is my favorite and it's the best. I just, I don't know. I've just never been that way. So I don't know, but I love Slay Play. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I'm like that. I was going to say a little bit, but I'm not like that at all because a lot of our <laughs> listeners, I'm not just saying this just because your husband wrote it, but I talk about the lighting thief okay. on the show constantly. I love that. All all, the time. I'm literally wearing my I sweatshirt right now, which is, I swear is a coincidence. I just never take it off. I saw. I saw. Oh, you okay. It. Um, so um, I've had so many listeners be like, I had to listen to the show just because you talk about it constantly. So I normally would say that I'm like that, but I'm not like that since like she's yeah. not April. No. And that's okay, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like there's nothing wrong with that. I just think I've always just been that way and, you know, just I don't know. And then I think I've gotten more so that way as I've gotten older and as I've gotten more in the biz. Yeah. And as I'm married to a writer mm. where it's <laughs> just like truly, you know, it, it's it's I just have such appreciation for the art mm. form that it's really hard for me to, you know, try to place ranking or judgment on them. So <laughs> I love fair. all musicals. That's what I always say. So we kind of touched on it a little bit, but what's your first memory of um, like a musical either you saw or anything like that? So a lot of people say, mention like a Disney movie that they saw and they were like, this is how I like my first introduction to musical theater. 
Um, you know, I, you know, I did, let's see, I don't know. I mean, I was always surrounded by music as a mm. kid. So that's kind of interesting because, you know, but it would be music like, um, you know, uh, you know, just like choir music or, yeah. you know, different types of singing and stuff. But the first like musical, I, I mean, I guess if it's a Disney movie, it would probably be Little Mermaid. Yeah. Because that, I mean, when that came out the first time, I mean, I, let I me mean, talk about like massive obsession. <laughs> um, and then I quickly fell out of love with Disney right after that. That was like the, the peak <laughs> and the only moment of my of being loving the little mermaid. Yeah. It was mostly because I had long hair and, um, I would watch it in the summer and we, my best friend and I would go to the pool. And so we'd go to the like neighborhood pool and then we'd come home and we'd have a hot dog that my mom would slice into little bites and watch the little mermaid every day. <laughs> That's amazing. But at the pool, we would do the like aerial hair flip. Yeah. You know, where she like, you know, flips up. And so mm. that was made Mainly my obsession was with the hair flip. And so I would do that every day at the pool and pretend I was was Ariel. No, actually, you know what? It was Annie. That was me too. It was Annie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, because I think Annie, prob- it was probably honestly about the same time, mm. but Annie was truly an obsession with the musical. Mm. I was really just into the hair for the little thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Annie, I loved the, the musical and I would watch it and I would sing all the songs. And in my bedroom, I had on one wall, I had these like built in drawers that yeah. were like built into the wall. And then, mm. you know, they went up, there's probably like six drawers. And then on top of it was like, what would be the top of a dresser but it sort of caved in so I could climb up there and sit right Uh and I would sit there and sing the opening number you know maybe far away (laughs) and lean and just act it out for myself as if because you know in the movie she's there in the window and she's like is sitting there in like a little nook kind of what I had in my bedroom and that was my life for a while was just singing that song yeah (laughs) that's so amazing I I was Annie (laughs) So there I you love go. That. that probably I love that predates so my hair much. obsession with the little mermaid. <laughs> Just about the hair. <laughs> apparently you and redheads, apparently. I guess. Actually, I was born with red hair, so maybe that's why. Oh. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you would like to um talk about in general? I know we've talked about like modern theater a little bit. Are there any opinions you have there? Or um I know that there was a lot of issues this year, especially with the shows you've worked on with like critics and stuff. Is there anything you want to say about that? Anything you want to say? If you if you want me to talk about it, I will. I would love that. (laughs) Oh, yes. We're ready for that. (laughs) That was me doing my little nudge nudge. That's like the thing I want to talk about the most. (laughs) Um, You know, I think that, um, you know, this was, you know, I think a really exciting year for Broadway. Absolutely. um, With with shows like uh, Be More Chill and the lightning thief kind of like you know prying their way <laughs> into yeah, the commercial theater absolutely. field and going look at us we belong here <laughs> um you know and i think that i think that um it's really yeah. exciting you know I, I i think that it um you know my hope is that and i really truly believe that you know in in another 10 years or so we will look back on 2019 and go this was a real turning point kind of like we were, mm-hmm. we were talking about these moments yeah. in, in musical theater history where we see you know um stories being told um that are trying to reach a different demographic yeah um and stories being told in different ways um and kind of breaking down the mold of what you know what people have thought of as traditional commercial broadway yeah. theater Absolutely. um I think that that's really hard. Um, you know, it's expensive Absolutely. to produce shows mm-hmm. on Broadway, and and there's mm-hmm. a reason that that mold exists. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, you know, my hope is that these are two shows that they got here, saying, "Look at how we got here." Yeah. First of all non-traditional paths and paths that were supported by teenagers and people in their Mm twenties. Um, you know, people saying, we love these stories. Mm -hmm. We want these stories to be told on Broadway. These are the stories that will make us buy tickets to Broadway shows. Um, you know, and I think that, um, uh, you know, hopefully we see the look back on this, this year as like a turning point, you know, I think (laughs) as far as like criticism goes, since you mentioned that, um, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I think that we have a lot of work to do in the world of theatrical criticism. Um, 
I was watching um, an interview actually with Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker himself, <laughs> um, talking um, about all sorts of different things. It was like an hour and a half long interview. But at one point they, they asked him, you know, what is your, um, you know, what's your favorite thing you've ever done? And he's like, oh, it's theater. I love theater. And he's like, I did this musical on Broadway in the 70s or the 80s. And, and it was so great. And I loved it. And, you know, we played out of town and, and they loved us and it was great. And, you know, and then, you know, we were, you know, playing uh, Broadway and right after we opened and I went on stage and, and I got no laughs and it was like a dead house and it was crazy. And I went back backstage and I asked my dresser, I was like, what, you know, what's going on? These jokes have been killing. They've loved yeah. loving it. And the dresser was like, well, they all read the review. And so wow. they don't, they don't want to look dumb. That's crazy. Because, you know they were told this was not good. That's and, terrible. And, you know, and so he goes on to like, you know, talk a lot about like the problems in criticism in theater. And it was really crazy mm. to watch Luke Skywalker talk about <laughs> the real problem in criticism, yeah. you know, and he talks specifically, um, you know, about the New York Times being this, this, you know, um, this newspaper that, um, has like a death grip on theater, yeah. truly. You know, mm -hmm. in no other art form is there one, one news outlet or one critic's, um, perspective that matters more than others. Yeah. Um, in, you know, in movies, there's no one critic that can give it a bad review and it'll kill a movie. Right. It just won't happen. Right. Yeah. right. We look at, we look at, you know, the big picture. Mm -hmm. We look at what, what fans say, you know, we go to Rotten mm -hmm. Tomatoes yeah. and we see that the critics hated it, but the, the you know, the, fans the, loved the, the it, fans yeah. loved it, you know, um, you know, and so we just, you know, you can literally just read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reviews about any movie that comes yeah. out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and the same thing in other genres, right. You have all these, you know, different opinions or you have less weighted opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just not that way with theater. You know, we, we, you know, have this one newspaper and people look at it as the be all end all. And it's really, really unfortunate. Um, particularly, you know, I, I think when it comes to criticism, there's a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. The first is that we sort of in the world of theater, at least we have sort of one, one paper that is sort of weighted more than others. Right. right? Mostly because of the reach, mm -hmm. you know, if you live in, mm -hmm. you know, I, and you want to go see a Broadway musical, you're going to type it up and yeah. you know, what's going to come up first, yeah. right. you know, the Times, this yeah. the New York times is going to come up first. Right. So it has a bigger reach. Um, and you know, when you are looking to invest your money in something, you know, and you happen to be wealthy, what paper are you probably going to read? Yeah. The New York times, yeah. the New York times. Mm -hmm. New York times. Right. So, you know, it has a very specific reach that I think, um, really, um, gives it a lot of power. Yeah. Right. So I think that's, that's an issue in theater particularly. Particularly. It's less of an issue in other genres, frankly, but in theater particularly. Mm. And then when you look at the paper, you have, you know, two main critics and then a handful of sort of secondary critics. And when those two main critics look just alike um, and are both white cisgender men in their 50s and 60s, that presents another problem, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, another problem that says, you know, you have two people that are probably going to have a really similar perspective. Um, and instead of allowing different perspectives to have as much weight as those two particular people, um, you know, you are, um, you're saying that, that these are the voices mm -hmm. that you're going to magnify um, in your paper. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with those voices, but we need some variety. So then that brings up another sort of issue in criticism is, you know, having, um, you know, a more you know, mul multiple points of view, right? Um, and particularly, Absolutely. I think that that particularly yeah. became a an issue with things like Be More Chill and Lightning Thief because you have shows that that are for teenagers and people in their 20s. Yeah, they're for, not for, for a younger yeah. demographic. So in, in no form or fashion are people, are certain demographics going to like the shows. And I don't, you know, of course they're not going to. It's right. not for them. I don't really care mm -hmm. if they like it. You know, it's like, you know, yes. frankly, like, I'm too old to like it. Like, if I don't <laughs> like it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not for me. You know what I mean? Right. There are plenty of shows, there are plenty of shows that I see that, you know, are not for me and that's okay. They don't have to be for me, you know? Um, but you know, you have a problem when it costs a bajillion trillion million dollars to produce a show on Broadway. And, you know, if you don't have enough time to find your audience, 
you know, reviews can can kill shows, you know, and Beetlejuice is a great example because it's a show that that didn't do great with critics, but they had enough money to run, which Mm -hmm. helped them find an audience. And guess what happened? They found an audience and they're a huge success and people love that show. Do you know what I mean? And it's great. You know, it's like that's a success story and a way that they were able to sort of get over, you know, the reviews and make it happen. But it takes a lot of money and, you know, you have to, you know, find that audience and they did and thank goodness they did you know it's great I'm so thrilled um but you know so I think we have a there's a lot of issues in criticism and so we know when I was talking about looking back on 2019 as a turning point hopefully it's a turning point in criticism you know there's been a lot of uproar and not just in the like be more chill lightning thief world but in other little pockets of the industry a lot of uproar about criticism and about a lot of different different news outlets you know you know so it's not like it's it's not like this is just the new york times you know again it's a very specific theater thing in the new york times it's not even in in other other aspects of, of the paper. Right. Um, and you know, generally when you look at all the major critics, you have a lot of people that look alike, um, in a lot of different ways. And, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we just need more, we need more perspectives and we need to give less weight to certain perspectives. You know, I think it's two things, you know, it's that we need, we need more and we need less importance on any one person's point of view, because I think that, you know, you know, I think that, you know, we'd like to think that critics don't matter, but they do. And they just do, at least in theater. And I'd love for that to change, you know? I mean, like, I'd love for it to be more like movies, you know? And just like, you know, let them, you know, let the stuff run and find what's right for you. And, you know, it's like, I, I made the comparison earlier this year that like New York is like, theater in New York is like being in a museum. You know, you walk around and you look at a lot of different paintings and some of the paintings you love and some of the paintings you don't love. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some of the paintings yeah. you look at it and you're like, oh my God, this is mesmerizing and you stare at it and you're looking and you want to read more about it and you're really into it. And some mm-hmm. paintings you just walk on past because they do nothing for you, you know? And being in New York with theater is kind of like that. We have so much theater here. Yeah. That it's like you, you know, you go and you see a show and you love it and you're obsessed with it and you buy the cast recording and you listen to it you go see it again and you go see another show and you go oh, I didn't really love it it wasn't for me okay and you move on you know this idea that like if we don't like something you know it doesn't have value we have to tear it, we have to tear it down or it doesn't yeah. have value it's just really problematic yeah absolutely so, um so I've kind of lived that in 2019 <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. and been in the heart of it and in the thick of it and uh, you know wouldn't change any of it but you know it has definitely impacted my perspective of the business and my perspective of the work we have to do Mm. and sort of you know hopefully where we're headed and hopefully the changes that we'll see in you know not just criticism but in the types of stories that get produced you know because criticism impacts what gets told impacts the stories that get told unfortunately I wish it didn't (laughs) you know I hope we look back on this you know interview and people go what is she talking about yeah. There, no, there are no critics. Exactly. We got rid of them, you know, but that's probably not the when case. When Broadway's so. just run by uh, shows for teenagers. <laughs> yeah, when it's just all te- whiny teenagers <laughs> just up there whining, know. you know, about everything, you know, because we go watch plays and watch middle aged white men whine about, you know, having a breakdown, which is, you know, all that happens in straight plays, you know, it's like old white guys complaining about their crises you know so give me give me teenagers you know screaming rock music any day (laughs) absolutely literally (laughs) well on that note that's a great way to end our interview is there uh is there anywhere people can find you like any social media obviously your website Yeah, my website's Amanda Flynn Voice, um, so you can find me there. But um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Amanda Flynnie, mm. F-L-Y-N-N-I-E. So you can find me there. Give me a follow. Reach out. Say hello. Yeah, she's awesome. I, I've been <laughs> following you for a couple months now, and you always Aww. make me smile. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that so much. We'll have links to all of her social media and the website in the description of today's episode. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. She's pretty cool, right? (laughs) (laughs) She is so awesome. And like, so like we said before, we were definitely nervous as it's kind of our first like interview style um, episode. But Mm. I was, I'm just so like, I feel justified Mm. in my opinions. (laughs) Yeah. Um, For the past six months, we've kind of had this like central theme of wanting theater and just like into this positive community and not this like pretentious community that it can sometimes right 
and just I and like everything that we've talked about about targeting a younger audience literally everything we've talked about in the last six months she brought up and so Mm -hmm. for someone who is like in the Broadway world someone who to just have the same opinions like it means the absolute world to me yeah absolutely like when she the whole time she was talking about um how much the second that she brought up that Hamilton was like one of the touchstones of like musical theater changing I was like oh all right like I yeah like I guess we're not we're not just like making stuff up (laughs) (laughs) again we're not the only ones with that observation yeah it's it's just it was that was so much fun Mm. I'm ready for the next interview (laughs) <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's not an interview next week, Eni, but we will have a guest next week. Ooh, so. we do have a guest next week. Mm-hmm. That'll be more of our um, normal usual broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, let us know if you guys liked this. I had a lot of fun. It's definitely, like I was telling um, Eni this I, probably today. I don't know. We talk a lot. <laughs> um, I absolutely love interviews. I constantly will find myself watching like hour and a half to two hour interviews on YouTube or like any talk show. Like when I was younger, I really wanted to be a talk show host just because I love listening to people talk um, and I love listening to how people's brains work. And so this was kind of like a dream thing for me that I got to sit down with someone who, you know, I admire so much, if that makes sense, um, and just talk to her about her thoughts on musical theater because, you know rightly so she has a lot of them because she's been in the world a little bit <laughs> just a little bit um yeah that's so. that's definitely why becca asked all the questions it had nothing to do with the like nervousness of me <laughs> not being able to function it's fine <laughs> yeah um so yeah it, this was like this was like a dream thing for me and i'm really excited to do more in the future oh for sure If you like our show, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps us immensely. You don't even know. Like, this is how people find our show, is if the more reviews we get and the more uh, five-star reviews we get, (laughs) um, it it puts us to the top of the iTunes algorithm. I don't know what that means, but all the podcasts I listen to say it. So (laughs) I know it helps. (laughs) This uh, review is a five-star review, and it comes from Little Dipper 2. They say, I love this podcast so much. The timing of me finding this podcast was amazing, too. I just listened to Dear Evan Hansen and the Book of Mormon, as suggested by a friend, and now I can't stop. I'm already planning a trip to see a couple of shows on Broadway. Becca and Inez, I love listening to you guys talk about musicals, and I have listened to a lot more recently because of your suggestions. Thank you. That's so sweet. Also, Dear Evan Hansen and the Book of Mormon? Heck yeah. For real. Um, guys, you can go to patreon.com slash sincerely us to become a patron of Sincerely Us. Um, our first 25 patrons are going to get a signed postcard. Ooh. Um, there's a bunch of tiers to choose from. Um, our most popular tier is the $3 tier, tier, which grants you access to the WBNE Discord. It is the best place on the internet. It's where Becca and I actually first met, I guess, and yeah. um, how where our friendship started. Um, for $10, you can get access to the bonus show, The Green Room, where we cover topics that just didn't fit into our main. It's a lot of fun. You guys should do it. Absolutely. This one is going to be a little weird, considering none of the topics would fit into the main show, because we didn't really have a topic for the main show. <laughs> yep, but it's still going to be great. <laughs> for $5, you get a shout out on the show. This episode is brought to you by Haley, Claire, Josh, Christy, Linton, Mott, and Sydney. Thank you so much for continuing to support our show and making our dream of podcasting come true. And interviews. Becca got to interview someone because <laughs> of you guys. This is great. Sincerely Us is a proud member of WBNE. There are a bunch of shows that we both love, like Following Dreams and Bagels. Also on the network is That's What I'm Talking About. And here's a preview of that. That's What I'm Talking About follows me, Mary Clay Watt, on my journey through Lord of the Rings for the very first time. Join me each week as I have fans on as guests so we can discuss the books one chapter at a time. From WBNE, That's What I'm Talking About. New episodes every Tuesday wherever you get podcasts. We love Mary Clay so much. As always, you can follow the pod on Twitter and Instagram at Sincerely Us Pod. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at underscore Eeny Meeny. That's I-N-Y-M-E-E-N-Y. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Becca Eddowes. That's B-E-C-C-A-E-D-D-O-W-S. Our art is by Vaishan Brandon of Graphite. You can follow him on Instagram at graphite.vmb. So to go off of um, kind of us breaking out of 
our normal and and trying new things, I'm going to leave you with a rent quote. You ready for this, Eni? No. No day but today. Sincerely, us. <laughs> <laughs>